So best practices as well with it is, you know, you want to target uh, for the editorial to be targeting uh, keywords that the product's showing up on a first page placement organically. Welcome to another episode of AMZ Pathfinders Beyond PPC. In today's episode, we have Chris from Seller Rocket. He is an expert at understanding connections between e-com, media, and tech. We've been getting a lot of inquiries from our partners about Amazon editorial recommendations and figured why not bring on a specialist from Seller Rocket to help us tackle the most common questions about publication, best practices, and uh, the best way to position yourself, really. So yeah, appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go ahead and start with the first question here. Is it primarily for Amazon or can it be used elsewhere? The editorial recommendations are both featured on Amazon as well as on the native publisher site, which will be found via like a Google search as well. Um, it's actually pretty interesting. The on Amazon ones, uh, there's about a hundred publishers in all that are part of the program. Um, they all were actually vetted and approved by Amazon. So these aren't just the you know, random blog posts that they kind of like found on the event and just slapped on their site. They actually did their own vetting and, and their own process, invited the publishers in to be a part of the program. And then obviously the native publishers uh, was on their website. They found you like a Google search. If you're typing best, you know, garlic press or best summer, summer games or something along those lines. How important is this content? Like, do you have any stats? Yeah, it, it's very important. Um, a, a key stat is about 60% of consumers, when they're researching into a category they're unfamiliar of, um, you know, like they're looking into buy a kitchen gadget or, or something, they're just trying to do some additional research. About 60% of those consumers rely on uh, third-party editorial recommendations uh, as a part of their researching factor. Because yes, you can go off, you know, reviews; those are always great. However, you know, not every review is perfect. There could be one-off instances that happen, um, and as many of you probably know. When something bad happens, it's going to reach nine to 10 people versus something good happening, which is like one to two. Um, so you know, reviews are, are one way to go about it, but uh, it's very important because these publishers do their own uh, third party individual research. They're not really swayed by reviews as much uh, as, part, as part of their content that they write. Yeah, the one that really comes to mind, Chris, as a um, great example of this is uh, Wirecutter. Mm -hmm. Um, that I think is like the 800 pound gorilla in the industry of like uh, product reviews and like, uh, I would say, you know, pretty high quality uh, assessment, you know, it's kind of like mm -hmm. the consumer reports for the internet. Like, uh, I remember when I was like 12, you know, my mom would get consumer reports and be like best fridges, you know, you like read the thing like, oh, this one is a crisper. Oh, look <laughs> yeah. at that. Yeah. Um, but now we have Wirecutter that does that. And famously, Wirecutter was bought by the New York Times for some like huge amount of money. I think the founder is one of the guys who founded Gizmodo back in the day. Mm -hmm. But anyway, are, are they part of this program? I mean, Wirecutter, they're kind of their own thing. Maybe they're not, maybe they're not part of the same program. So Wirecutter is one of the, uh, the publications uh, that's a part of the program. They do some content that's on Amazon. They're obviously, you know, the 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 industry. Yeah. Um, another, yeah. And one that we personally work with uh, is actually the LA Times. Uh, their subdomain is Best Discovery. Uh, so it is basically like the wire cutter to New York Times. The LA Times has their own as well. I had no idea. Yeah. yeah it's a great revenue stream for some of these papers that, you know, probably are struggling in other ways, but that's a totally different conversation. <laughs> yeah. And then I guess, I guess my, my other thought about that is like what people are essentially looking for, for is uh, curation, right? So mm -hmm. that that's, you know, if you have a trusted voice at the wire cutter or, you know, the LA times one, for example, uh, what people are looking for is that curation and, you know, the reviews on Amazon are great, but there's diminishing returns. Like, you know, if, if you ask me, well, what's the difference between 4,000 and 5,000 reviews on Amazon? Eh, I, I don't know. Is anyone going to make a purchasing decision based on that Delta? I, I don't know. But a well thought out um, review and in-depth analysis of a product's features is probably more powerful. Exactly. And, you know, one piece to all consider as well is, you know, the, the publishers are looking at a lot of different products in that category. And they're even giving comparisons in the editor as well. So like, obviously a lot of times there's the best overall, but you know, sometimes they put in things like, Hey, especially when it comes to any like skincare, things like, Hey, this is best for soft skin. It may not be labeled the best overall, but like if you have softer skin, this is going to be more, you know, more attractive to you, or this, you know, this one's better on a budget. And so they, they not only accommodate like, Hey, this is the best product. They also like look into other products features as well that may be more attractive to get different uh, consumers. 
all kinds of variations. Correct. Honestly, price is a pretty big factor in a lot of buying decisions, but there's a lot of things also to consider as well for people who don't necessarily have price or like they have they have certain needs that need to be met. Those are usually kind of highlighted in those editorials as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. For me personally, like backpacks, I don't really have a price sensitivity to like a good bag, you know? So speaking of categories, you know, because these are being posted on, I would say advertiser friendly publications, what categories or products does these recommendations work well for versus not? So it's, unfortunately, it's kind of all over the board and it's also very seasonal. Um, now, one particular category that does kind of well unilaterally is technology. Um, so like I know one, one of the top trending articles that's always doing well on Amazon is, you know, the, the top earbuds because um, everybody's going through earbuds left and right. And so that's always like a big one. Kitchen appliances do really, really well uh, from air fryers to like garlic presses, you know, things along that line. Uh, but then anything that's kind of more coming into season. So obviously we're, we're approaching summertime here. So like lawn chairs, outdoor stuff, um, those kind of come into big, big plays as well. Yeah, Chris, and if you're not clued into this, it's pretty interesting, but um, there's something called um, brand analytics, which is a, a tool inside of, uh, you know, Seller Central that sellers can use. And basically you can see the search frequency rank. So the lower the number, the higher the volume of search. And if you go in there any like uh, any given week or month, like Bluetooth headphones is like almost always one of the top five searches. So no doubt that uh, that is something that has a tremendous volume. Um, and it's not just Apple ones, although those do make up a huge portion, but uh, people are looking for ones from other brands. Too. Yeah, I would definitely say what the performance of those it tends to correlate pretty, pretty high with how the, the search volume goes within those particular categories as well. Mm, interesting. Electronics being the big one. I mean, that requires a lot of specialization in terms of like knowledge and understanding of these products. Does Seller Rocket write the editorials or do the publishers? No, we we don't do any of the writing whatsoever. It's solely on the publishers. Um, how we came about is an interesting story. So our founder uh, was also a co-founder of bestreviews.com, which is a well-known publication that does you know product reviews. And they were actually the piloting publisher that did this program with Amazon. And so what they realized is during the time, there was a huge gap when it came to brands trying to be featured in this content and publishers trying to figure out what brands are actually worth featuring in the content, you know, because they do get kickbacks from Amazon for any purchases that come about from it. So they want to market the best they can for Amazon to get the most purchases. So they they stick back. So that's actually how we were created was to be that middleman to kind of filter out, okay, we look at the, you know, someone approaches us with the product that they want to get featured in. We kind of take a look at it and what, and, you know, go with our network of publishers uh, for on Amazon, work with over 60 publishers for off Amazon, about 80 uh, and kind of figure out what publisher one, get, get the product in their hands to potentially pick it up and two, kind of vet the product to let you know, the brand know like, Hey, this actually can be featured or, Hey, you want to be featured, but you're probably not going to be. And here's some reasons why. But all, right, but interesting. all of the write-up is still completely independent on the publishers. Um, that's actually you know part of the agreement with Amazon <clears throat> because that that's why Amazon wanted this program was to help curb consumer distrust because you know word was getting out several years ago about fake reviews for products and everything. So there as a way to kind of sway that you know they they brought in these publishers and work with publishers because it, it is an uh, independent write-up from an accredited publisher and it's, it, you can prove it's a real person doing it. It's not just a, a bot or anything like that creating it. Right, and I heard something else you mentioned there, which is that the uh, you guys have relationships with off Amazon publishers too. So, uh, you know, when you have clients come through or someone brings you a product and you guys find it suitable, uh, you feature it on Amazon, or at least you make an effort to make that happen. I understand it's not always 100%, but um, you know, they're, they're found on other uh, publications too off Amazon. What's that like? Yeah. So if you ever kind of, you know, go searching like best ab roller or best bronzing spray because it's summertime trying to get your tan on, um, you know, like the LA Times ha has an article like that. Also, Sports Illustrated has the best, uh, best ab roller uh, article that they do. So it's, you know, I, ideally it, it, the product's featured in both because then you're attracting consumers who are shopping via Google and researching that way, but then also uh, consumers who may be on Amazon and going about that route in their research and discovery or just overall shopping. Mm -hmm. So that's the best of both worlds. But there are some categories that the Amazon editorial that they will not allow through. Um, anything that is COVID related, anything that makes a medical claim, uh, anything that has to deal with a weapon or of some sort. So like not necessarily a weapon in particular, but like a good example is a, an ice mold that makes bullets, bullet ice cubes. 
It, it, yeah, believe, believe it or not, we've had had that come come across us. Okay, it's um, a very specific product. All right, um, you know, but it, it's associated with a weapon. So, like Amazon, from a liability standpoint, doesn't want to deal with it. Anything that's political based, because um, you know, again, that could cause some friction at that end. And then one more recently is supplements. Amazon, from a liability standpoint, you know, really kind of wants to shut it off. So, like, they're very very picky of what supplement editorials they let through. They have their own kind of digital criteria and certain publishers have kind of really mastered it, but even still those publishers have mastered it, you know, they may approach new editorials and they still get, you know, pushed away. Um, however, from the, the native publisher content, there, there is a little more flexibility because it's not Amazon tools that they're dealing with, right? It's, it's published on their specific native website. Um, it just directs traffic to the Amazon PDP page for the purchase. So that has a little more flexibility, but so like supplements are allowed on that end. However, still, Anything that could be kind of a liability, firearms, COVID, that's claims they should tend to shy away from too. Yeah, that makes sense. Got it. Mm -hmm. But another way too that the off Amazon native publisher kind of is beneficial is one of the properties that we work with, the McClatchy properties. Uh, they're like Miami Herald, Charlotte's, they're more like local sourced uh, mm -hmm. newspapers. And be because of that, you know, you're attracting more locality as well with products. So if there's a specific product that may be a niche that, you know, a, a certain area of the, the United States or a certain area of the continent, you know, may want to target, there could be properties that are kind of focused on there as well. Right, right. Yeah. The, uh, the anti-alligator spray market really blown up in Miami. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. I didn't mention this in the beginning of the interview, but if you haven't done so already, please sign up for the newsletter. The description is in the link below. Once you get in, you'll get three things. You'll get news, you get content, and you'll get recommendations. Now, with this kind of information, it has helped our clients get into really interesting beta programs right before their competitors are able to even know that they exist. We talk about trends before they pop off. We even helped a client change their product right before Amazon had a policy or regulation in place and that would have really messed up their cash flow. They learned all that in our newsletter. So if you haven't done so, do it for you. We highly recommend it. Click the link below, sign up today. Other than that, enjoy the interview. Okay, that's pretty cool. I mean, for a product to see great results to, and then hopefully find success in becoming a recommended editorial piece for Amazon, what are some things to consider? Like, do you have any best practices that you normally give to you know potential partners? So um, first and foremost, the on Amazon editorials do have a minimum requirement to even be considered. Um, the first is the product has to have a four-star rating as well as a hundred reviews. So it has to have a little bit of establishment going on before it even be considered uh, by a publisher. The only way that can kind of go around that is if it's a top 10 seller. Uh, so example, I have a client that um, they're, they're a microscope and so that they don't have that review threshold. However, it's their top 10 selling product. And so Amazon recognizes that as like, okay, this is, this is up and coming. It's going to get that review threshold at some point. We'll still allow it through to be considered. But one thing to consider as well is specifically how the editorial show up is like, they're all based off kind of keywords that are targeting. But it's interesting is Amazon dictates the keyword that the editorial shows up regardless of how it's titled. So in case, case point example, garlic press, is a keyword, the high volume keyword. Uh, however, editorials that show up for it is garlic presses, garlic mincers, garlic smashers at times. And so there could be slight fluctuations of the keyword of how it kind of shows up. So best practices as well with it is, you know, you want to target uh, for the editorial to be targeting uh, keywords that the product's showing up on a first page placement organically, because that it's a psychology piece. So if the product is shown in a sponsored ad, PPC, they see it organically on the first page. The editorial is only legitimizing why the product is showing up there because people understand, you know, when they see the sponsored right there, uh, tags like, okay, they're paying to be there. However, organically, that's, that's not as simple and can be very, very hard to show up on a keyword organically. But then in the editorial itself, like, okay, this is a third party publisher that's legitimizing why this product is showing up. But a key piece too is like, you know, for clients that work with us is it's not meant to replace any marketing strategies. It's only meant to enhance marketing strategy. You still have to heavily invest in PPC. You still have to heavily invest in banner ads. Um, because of that, you know, all the case studies that we have um, that we've been doing this with, you know, they'll see a, a sales uptick, you know, on average is 30%, 40%. We have some cases of 53% sales uptick. But what's interesting is only seven to 9% of that uptick is directly affiliated through the editorials. They see a huge increase in the organic sales 
a big increase in PPC purchases. So it's it's one of those like only a small fraction is really affiliated to the editor, but there's a lot of halo effect that goes along with it. Right. So it's like a credibility booster and you need to have these other um, these other efforts running full steam in order to maximize it. Correct. And, you know, an advantage to the native publisher side of things is that it's directing traffic back to the Amazon PDP page. So Amazon's going to purchase and it's taking away the purchase from a potential competitor, you know, Walmart, Target or even the, the publisher or the, the brand site. And so they actually reward the product, you know, on Amazon by boosting its organic rank that way. Actually, I have a question that uh, I think we have in our in our set here, but I want to ask now because I think it's germane to what we just talked about, which is, you know, do you guys track, study, follow the actual appearance of these editorial recommendations? Uh, I don't know what to call them, boxes, modules inside of uh, SERP? And if so, you know, what's the evolution of that? Has it gone from one placement to more than one? Is it showing up on mobile more often? Is it showing up at the top of the page? Do we see it on product pages? I have so many questions about this. <laughs> yeah. So normally it tends to show up on more like higher volume keyword searches, but you know, kind of more like basic keywords like garlic press or you know, bronzing spray or, or something along those lines. Anything that's more like brand specific, more than likely not going to show up on those because it's more geared towards you know, educating consumers about the product itself. It's interesting that for the Amazon side of things, there's an algorithm at play. So it takes into account time of day, previous search history, previous purchases, uh, what are inventory levels like at local fulfillment center, and where are you located in the world? All going to play of like how the editorials kind of show up. So, you know, I'm here in Columbus, Ohio. I may search a certain keyword. You can search the same keyword in, L in Los Angeles. You may see completely different editorials show up at the same time of day because it's all just kind of a lot of things going to play or... If you search that product a lot on a regular basis, more than likely you're going to have an editorial not show up because then the algorithm thinks like, hey, you're more educated about this product in, or this category in general. There's a more gear towards educating consumers into it. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like search fatigue. It's why we always recommend to clients when they talk about like, oh, I can't see this ad or this thing. It's like, well, that's a factor, the location, the fulfillment centers that affects ads as well. But also if you really want to do a pure test, you know, you might have to set up a VPN and put your IP through a different... Um, geolocation or even, uh, you know, or open an open incognito browser in Chrome or whatever to really get an impartial result. And even then, there's no guarantee that you'll see whatever this thing is. Um, so yeah, how, how about mobile then? Because mobile, I mean, we looked at our stats for our clients recently because uh, Amazon has given us the ability to see the percentage of sessions on mobile. And, you know, many of our clients have actually a majority of sessions from mobile. You know, if that traffic converts as well is another matter, but the actual number of it is really, is really high. So how about mobile? Yeah, so we don't get much visibility into how the editor is running via mobile. Um, however, what we do get from the publishers is the transaction data, and that is separated out desktop versus mobile. So we do get at least see the visibility of overall conversions, what, what is separated out from a typical desktop versus mobile. Um, another interesting piece, too, is you know, Amazon, they're Fortune 5 company. They, they invest millions of dollars into research and development. And so some things that we do see and have seen over time is them changing the editorial placements a little bit of how they at least look. So the, the typical way and the most popular way is you see one publication features three to four products and you see it in the, in the scroll box middle of the page or more towards the top middle of the page. However, every now and then too, you may see it as like articles related to your search. So they may see that as, hey, this category is getting a lot more newer consumers into it. So we're going to show multiple editorials at once. Not showing the products, but just showing the editorials themselves for you to click into and review there. A newer way that was for a brief hot minute, um, but we may see come back in the near future is where they showcase the editorials where they showcase four products and it was labeled as best overall, which included editorials and reviews. And it showed four products, but then it showed what editorials those products were featured in. So it's like, hey, here's this product that was featured in these three editorials. And if you clicked it, it would show them. And that was for about a month long that we saw that. And then it kind of switched back to the normal way. So again, Amazon's always, ultimately it's to the better of the brand because they care about conversions, right? They want to get more money. And so they just invest in different ways of how it's showcased to figure out how it can be more incentivizing to a consumer to make a purchase through that route. Got it. I, I did have a question kind of going back to keyword targeting. Is that something that with the publications that you work with, is that something that you guys educate them on? Is this something that they are in charge with, like in, in putting the keywords or yeah, like how, how does that, how does that work between you and that publication? So what, what we do with you know brands that we work with and we're like, hey, this could be picked up for a publication pretty easily is we, we submit two to three keywords to target. 
So typically the publisher will select one of those and title the editorial after it. Uh, however, again, as I mentioned, it's up to Amazon of what usually shows up. Um, but publishers have a pretty good idea and some insights that you know ne- we're not as much aware of, like overall conversions. And so that's why sometimes you see, like you search one keyword and a, a different article is kind of showing up because it's converting over that. You know, And sometimes some people are like, hey, I want to target this keyword because it's got the most high volume. Well, the way those editorials work is if they don't convert to a certain percentage, Amazon just takes them down or makes it so they never show up. And so the publishers have better insights on that of like what's converting well. So like, yes, you submitted these two to three keywords that you want to target. However, we're going to do this one because this is actually getting a much higher conversion rate. And we know it's going to get to be much more successful under these keywords versus this one. Interesting. So there has to be, you know, so-called alignment between the search query and the actual products. The same is true with ads, of course, but like, just like ads, you don't really know until you test it actually in many cases and your assumptions as well founded as they can be. And based on current data might not actually pan out. Um, so that can be frustrating, but yeah. Well, let's talk results in terms of success rate percentage. What is that number? Uh, when, it, when it comes to products getting featured? Yep. So we have about a 75% match rate of getting products featured. So we do a lot of due diligence on our end, the front, in the front end of being realistic, you know, with the client, like, hey, like we reviewed your products, we think this is a good fit. And sometimes we're, we review probably, like, hey, this is a good fit for the native publisher content, not so much for the Amazon content, you know, and vice versa, like, hey, this is a product that would be great for Amazon content, but maybe not native publisher content. Again, based off categories, seasonality, overall kind of reviews of the, of the products, you know, and things like that. So o- overall with about 75%, we get it matched to a publisher. Wow. Yeah. That's a pretty high success rate. Mm-hmm. It, it helps having our, uh, the people who create our business coming from the publisher world. <laughs> so they, they had all the insights. Right. Yeah, that's part of your entrenched advantage, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. They know that. Is there any, anything else you can add about what lift products and brands see after being featured? Um, yeah. You mentioned between like 30 to 50% at the highest end halo effect. Yeah. I don't know. Would there be anything that you'd like to add to that? Yeah. Um, some other like, you know, features as well as one, it, it's, it's all credible media that you're being picked up in, you know, the, the publishers that we work with and that, you know, typically are successful, specifically the Amazon editors, like they're credible media, our data publishers that we work with, they, they have a domain rank of 80 or above. So they see high traffic volumes, like the LA times, for example, sees like 134 million users a year. You know, we're not just working with small media. And so a lot of times, too, when we get the products featured in there, they're able to go back into their own brand websites they like featured in, you know, LA Times, Future and Sports Illustrated or something along those lines uh, to really highlight an additional, you know, you can't really measure that metric to the overall effects, but at least show some credibility to your product. And as well as I mentioned, like boost and organic rank. So, you know, Amazon loves traffic being driven to their website. So from a native publisher side, if they're driving traffic to the PDP page to Amazon makes purchase, they're going to reward the brand with you know, boosting its organic rank. What the boost is, we don't quite know, um, but we do have a case study of a client of ours that is bat bombs. It's a very competitive category, um, but when they were picked up on native publisher content, the first month that it went live, they were populating on page four of a search result. Uh, but after two months, it was showing up on the first page. That's great. Yeah, and actually that raises another question, which is like, what's the time frame for this? Because my, my understanding from what um, I've learned about you guys before and, you know, this conversation is it, it does take some time. This is not a, a, a quick a quick thing. No. Uh, just like, it's kind of like SEO on a website, you know, it takes months to build. Maybe it's a good comparison. Exactly. Uh, to get, like, once we are able to, like, start working with a product and get it in the hands of the publishers, for the native publisher content, it, it takes about two to four weeks for the content to even go live. On average, for on Amazon, it takes longer between six to eight because again, it's on Amazon's website. They have to approve it, so they go through their own criteria, checking it, and finally give the okay and green light to put it up. Um, but from to actually start to see performance, it does take some time. Uh, we we recommend at a minimum three months because that's where you're going to kind of gauge of the overall like investment versus return, what traction that we're getting. But then also kind of see in that time frame what halo effect that you're getting as well. Because again, you know. From the transactions that we get from the publishers, it's only like seven to nine percent of the overall sales list. Um, so that's but so within three months, we can have usually a good set of data of like, okay, where are we trending here? We're on the good trend, you know, like th- this is definitely worth continuing with, or like, hey, let's let's start to pivot some strategies to really elevate this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Cool. I think that answers all our questions. Yeah. Again, Chris, thank you so much for coming on. If anyone is interested in working with Seller Rocket. How can they best reach you and the team? Maybe even figure out to see if they're even ready for something like this. 
So you can always go to our website, which is uh, sellerrocket.io. Uh, there's a contact us form in there. You know, you go once you click into that, someone will reach out to you. Um, or you can contact me directly. Uh, I'm the general manager here at Seller Rocket. So my email is chris at sellerrocket.io. Either way is perfectly fine. You have to reach out to me directly. I'll gladly get in the hand, you know, get in the hands of somebody who can help you or just reach out myself directly and, and get things working for you. Nice. Yeah, I think we've had a few clients who have used your guys' services. Um, so yeah, it's it's good to good to spotlight this a little bit because uh, in Amazon in 2022, anything anything helps. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah, appreciate you having me. It's a pleasure, guys. If you're still watching, thank you. It must mean that you really like what you just watched, or a bale of hay just fell on top of you and you can't reach the space bar. Whatever it is, I appreciate it. Hope you like it enough to like and subscribe. And if you're interested in more, check out more videos we have available. And thanks. I'm Matt from AMZ Pathfinder, and I will see you next time.